this evening is the second of our sessions of readings by poets commended in the 2021 Hippocrates Prize. Most of you reading this evening um, were commended in the health professional category. There are a couple, um, as it were, held over. Uh, Rosie Shepherd, Linda Snell, and indeed Mark, who's beginning who are in the open category. I think that's correct, isn't it? Mark, you were open category. Yeah. Um, and um, but most of you are health professional uh, readers who are reading this evening. Um, and I think that without more ado, I'm just going to hold up the book in question and remind anyone who needs more copies that they can be had for the asking. Um, but now let us go on to Mark. Um, the first of the two poems um, uh, in, the, uh, in the open category that I want to read um, is about this is about being a parent in the in the um, uh, health service and realizing that explaining to a child what um, might be wrong and how it's going to be fixed is quite difficult and it's a skill that I think so many health service professionals it's take for granted or it's natural and they do it but when you're a young parent it's very hard to begin to understand that. So um, the first poem that I wanted to, to read um, that, um, is called Antibodies for Kids. And it's, uh, this is a poem um, written to a child. And in fact, it's from my experience with my firstborn who got tracheitis, ended up in hospital. We're all very worried, fantastic, you know, and then I had to explain what was happening to him. Um, so antibodies for kids. And this is to him, to Alec. How many, you ask? Oh, more than a hundred, I guess, maybe thousands. Against the current they sail, they row, crest and skim, with your heart to guide them. Here, where you lie, in a back to front gown, covered in tubes and a mask, the nurses call them white cells, since each one catches the light, like they have a poem inside, made purely of life. This is why they shine, why they know where to go. They, th they sing these same verses outside the enemy walls, which tumble and roll away, as if you dream them up out of marshmallows. Inside, all of the bullies melt into puddles of chocolate. You will yawn awake like a giant on a sunny hillside, and the world will be yours again, smelling of milk and pancakes. The robot machines by your bed will stop bleeping, and you will be cross with us, because we're both laughing at something no one can see not even with a microscope. So that's antibodies for kids. That's trying to explain what an antibody is. It's a poem. Um, and the second one, um, it's really um, comes from, I was uh, getting treatment for prostate cancer. And um, uh, I found myself during one of the tests periods uh um having uh you know just had a checkup sitting um next to a very dignified lady of around 80 years old um and this is a story about coming out of the doctor's surgery going into the waiting room and meeting her it's called for the love of strangers and we start in the dock with the doctor the pad of her finger on the blue of my wrist, professionally touching where the violets flow, unseen and scentless. She reads my heart's code better than anyone. My blood will not be needed today. Drifting antiseptics sing of bone-dry martinis, 
professionally crushed elsewhere. Outside, we await results on plastic chairs. The TV gossip mags have been recently trashed for fear of infection. Surfaces are more dangerous than before. For every malady that makes us mortal, they have a brochure. Diabetes, menopause, anxiety, flu, chlamydia, testicular cancer, stacked in a wire rack that says, take one. Maybe I'll take the lot. Defying the wall signs, I rub my itchy eyes when I see her fingers steepled like jurors, papered and drawn upon with age. A loose wedding band flashes on her lap. She squints for her name on the dot matrix board as if to a foreign shoreline. Her coat is still buttoned up right to the top. She might have a small suitcase. I want to settle my hands on hers like a dove or a sun or a prayer. I need to tell her that whatever it is, my love, we already have a cure. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Thank you for those two very searching and tender poems. Excellent stuff. What a lovely beginning. Thank you. I have Shirley, Shirley Allah next. It's a very short one. Um, and I think with the pandemic, you know, we, we are all affected, but I just keep on thinking for children, everything is so virtual and things aren't tactile. And I'm thinking, oh, this is so, like you just, you just feel so deprived. Open things up again and you could go into stores as long as you were mindful having your mask on and, and you had to put the hand sanitizer in. And uh, the first store that I had walked into since the pandemic, there was a woman there and doing her job well. So she had a rope in front of the door, her mask was on, and she had this huge container of hand sanitizer. And um, she just wanted to make sure that your mask was on correctly. And she gave you a huge dollop of it. And when she gave it to me, I just thought, oh, if there was just a better way, if we could just, oh, just burrow our hands in sand instead of this chemical hand sanitizer or roll around on the grass, just anything but this sterile atmosphere, especially for children. And anyway, um, this short little poem just kind of wrote itself then. So anyway, it's called um, Barriers. Um, clear, cool gel, guardian at the door. Oh, how I wish there were a better way, like burrowing my hands, then sifting sand or roll around on grass freshly mowed to protect me from this virus unseen. But my favorite would be to slither around on the rocks made smooth by the pounding of North Atlantic waves. Anything but this chemical gel, masked distance, and the children's stifled laughter barriers. <laughs> Thank you very much, Charlie. Hi, I'm Jane Boxall. This poem is called Breakers. I'd almost forgotten, after years, the suddenly swimming grass, those shining sirens. I was no longer anxiously attuned to auras, tremors, or the silly sidekick of a myoclonic jerk. Until, under startling sub-zero sun, my breath freezes, is seized again. The old wave towers up like a bad debt, vision shattering at ice-glazed concrete. Save for the paramedics, I'm alone, wired to some giant metronome. One murmurs, 140 is very high. I'm so sorry, I cry. I ask them to let me go. Thank you very much. In between. 
I want to tell you again and again, this threat, the new swelling beneath my jaw, is as if some kind of God has told me I must play nicely with my toys or they'll be taken away and given to children who want them. Look, look, I can feel the universe fall from I don't know where through my head into words I can squidge in biro on paper. I can go and stand by the sea, feel it surge. I can walk right up to oak trees and hug them. James, on the Macmillan chat site, said the same, that cancer's worth it. The shaman in Finland, chanting, drumming, sweating, said cancer appeared to her as a bird that hops and jitters, speaks of the unity of body and soul and lives between them. While the shaman was praying 2,000 miles away, a poem flew down through my mind into my notebook, a prayer to a God I don't believe in, who sent a bird to perch in my hand, a bird that now I will always have with me. This is the poem. And that was a lovely reading. Let us move on to Diana Kent. Thank you very much indeed. I, I work as a child psychotherapist, so this is a poem um, that is about the very common presenting problem in the consulting room, which is about self-harm. So this is my poem, Signet. I watch her as she comes, step dragging down the path, sullen, sulky, her feet betray her. Meeting me was never her idea. This will be hard, I think, and so it proves blood from a stone girl. Her words betray her. Talking to me was never her idea. She draws blood from white limbs with a pencil sharpener blade. This is her idea. Pressure letting to ease numb pain taut as drum skin. From a thicket of hair, she rolls her eyes, flashes me a glimpse of the woman she will become. She rolls her eyes and rolls herself alive, brave as a swan in full sail, gathering her freedom to her like a song that one day will be glorious, but today is muted, muffled by gray down, waiting to be shed. Thank you very much, Diana. Thank you so much for that. The next reader is Stuart, Stuart Charles. Well, I'm really glad to be in the anthology with everyone who's here. It's, it's really lovely, great company, nice to be recognized for writing with my healthcare colleagues and to be able to share this one with uh, the other nurses who I work with. It's called Handover. I don't want to take the trolley keys from you, none like night nurse, ending your hours, observing silence and darkness, chanting your handover to us, turning your notes on each patient into a psalm, your palms sweat on the necks and teeth of keys. I don't want it mixing with mine. I don't want to have my turn being you. I want the other day nurse to say she'll hold the keys. I'm bone weary just listening. That was absolutely superb. Thank you very much, Stuart. A referral from the ENT clinic. A man, still shocked by the speed of the laryngectomy, loss of voice, income, role, the diagnosis. I was young and newly trained, 
imposter syndrome threatening to swallow me whole. It didn't start well. My accent a reminder of someone who once swindled him. All I could do was breathe, give him time, acknowledge his anger, and hear, really hear, each explosive hard-won word. Over the weeks, he taught me so much that eyes, hands, shrugs are an elemental language, that silence can be an oasis in a desert of words, that caring is a mix of realism and love. At our last appointment, he brought a gift, a yellow plastic bath brush wrapped in brown paper Against the rules, of course, but I read in his eyes the joy of giving back. Thank you, Yora. What an unusual gift. <laughs> yes, it was a surprise. I, I assumed it was, he either had one already, or it was all he could afford. And we go to Australia for our next reader, Andy Dimitri. Hi, everybody. Um, as you probably all know, we're in pretty strict lockdown in Sydney at the moment. I'm, I'm a lung doctor, so I've been working in the hospital with COVID patients. But I work for Médecins Sans Frontières in my other um, job. And I've you know been travelling around the world for the last 10 years on and off, working in different parts of the world, usually in crisis areas. And I did work in the Rohingya refugee camps when they were newly formed in uh, 2018. So this is a poem about the, dip, the diphtheria outbreak in the Rohingya camps. I stood on the border with Bangladesh and Myanmar. And it's called Three Months. Diphtheria was always just the D in the DPT vaccine to me. I didn't know what it was until it was everywhere around me in this sprawling camp. Dr. Arnick tells me that the small child's neighbor died yesterday. There's a lot of death here. The boy's neck is swollen with nodes and he gasps for air. The Rohingya camp stretches on for miles and miles. We start driving through it at 8 a.m. and we're still going at 8.30 and we're still going at nine. It already feels like a shanty town, like it has been here for 100 long, slow years. Three months, really? Only this long? Come, let me show you the markets and the mosques. Come, I'll show you the restaurants and we can stroll through the bazaars in the misty evening as the muezzin cries out. We can chat to the kids selling beans and beetle nut and wander through the small schools and listen to their chants. Later, as the sun is setting and the heat of the day is released, we can head down to the dusty football field and cheer on a team of young, stateless kids as they shoot for the bamboo goal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andy. Next, we come to David Francis. Yeah, I'm in a place uh, called Phillip Island, which is about 150 kilometers south of Melbourne. And uh, we've been in lockdown for about, I think it's about 240 days now. Uh, I was a, a general surgeon uh, before I specialized in transplant uh, surgery. I used to do uh, a lot of um, mastectomy operations, which uh, I always really disliked doing. Uh, probably nowhere near as much as the patients uh, that I operated on. But anyway, I, I've uh, written this poem. Uh, it's called Monsoon. And the epigraph is, uh, sometimes awful things have their own kind of beauty. Uh, a phrase written by the poet Henry Cole. Uh, Monsoon. Adequate anesthesia is obtained, and she is placed in a supine position, her body then draped in the usual sterile manner. An elliptical incision is made, and a red tear trickles from the eye of the Buddha. The dissection continues sharply down to the pectoral muscle, perforating vessels ligated and divided, the loose areolar tissue giving way freely. Later, Awakening slowly, she remembers her suckling child, a man and the cup of his hand, his lips, the thrill through her body. 
she murmurs about singularity, the foolishness of beauty and the fragrance of solitude, of heavy rains and specific points in time. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, David. And we go next to Andy Jackson. It's dark at the moment, so I can't see what the weather's doing. Nice to see you all anyway. And thanks again for including me in, uh, in the anthology. Um, it's always great to hear from Hippocrates people every year. It's something new. So I'm really thrilled to be part of that again. Uh, my poem, which was commended and thanks for that, was Dementia Song. And it's based on observation of my mother-in-law's progression through vascular dementia, the deterioration of a memory, uh, followed by the deterioration of language and eventually the deterioration of the basic structures of a life. It's quite hard to read aloud actually because it's full of stops and pauses and missing pieces and perhaps works a bit better on the page where the text, the poem sort of deteriorates until it falls into chaos. This is Dementia Song. What should I write now? Should I write? I still have stories to tell. I remember when there was more than day stroke night that my birthday fell in November. December? Yes, of course. What day? Are you sure? Yes, of course it was. If I had knew, known, what did I say? Well, this story won't tell itself because this story, the story of small deaths, of bereavements by a decree. Degree, what did I say? Yes, of course. The test is in the held notes of the memory. My lungs not being what they, lungs. The held notes of the memory. Hands are unlearning me. I still have songs to sing. Small deaths, you understand? I'm talking, but the words, of course, I haven't forgotten. Memory is tracing paper, outlines, no detail. Gets worse the more I, what, why are we whispering? You're talking about me? You were. What are you, what are you saying about me? This story, I know where it ends. I don't know something about bereavement, bereavement, what, last night? When? Talking about me, the treatment. I don't know where it ends. I don't feel well, not well. Sing me a song. Shall we? Song to sing. Shall we? Yes. Who is she? I don't know her. She's still singing all night. I don't know what for. Phone. Phone ringing. Do we have a phone? Are we in? You are. Are you? Yes. We're alone, aren't we? We are. Here. Are we? Songs to sing. Tell me a story, something. Who are you? Stop. Right. Thank you. Andy, what a difficult poem to read that is. I've been wondering how you would manage it as it gradually disintegrates and you know, stanza by stanza. As I feel <laughs> I have done as well, trying to read it. So yeah, it isn't yeah. easy, but um, it works on the page, I think, a little bit better, as I said. So um, hopefully some of you will follow I don't mean it. any disrespect at all to your reading of it if I say that it possibly does work better on the page. Because on the page, it's it's rather like Samuel Beckett. It's 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 like speech that is whole falling apart in front of your eyes. 
it's it's truly wonderful on the page and very 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 difficult to read that's the truth of it thank well, you thank you for letting me try anyway oh no, you you did it very well but it's such a formidable challenge what a challenge Thanks, there you go. Diana's saying it works so well as you read it too. She's making sure I'm not getting the wrong vibes here or anything. No, it's, it's by the way, since our last two readers were from Australia, um, let me just point you as a matter of interest to a poem by the magnificent Australian poet Robert Gray, which is called The Departing Light. It's a six page poem which is a profile of his mother with dementia at the age of 90 and to my mind a truly remarkable uh, poem on the subject of dementia I think it might interest you Robert Gray the name the departing light is the poem thank you very much Andy we go on to Anne J Anne Lillian J Good evening, everybody. This is my poem, Confessional. In the small grey room where we go to put a needle in my arm, guilt hangs in the air. St Agatha wanders by, breasts on a tray, stiff as meringues, sacrificed to her God in vain. I have put my faith in knives and needles red and unnatural fluids burning their way through the one-way system of my veins. Nausea endured. The exquisite hit of dexamethasone, 5-fluorouracil, cyclophosphamide and epirubicin. That cleansing mix that kills 99% of all cancer cells. Even the well-travelled ones. Beneath my hat, the scalp I carry home is naked as the Christmas turkey's bum. My shaven head retreats from the world. Stigmata are bravely born. And I whisper prayers like some tormented, wide-eyed nun. Thank you. Yeah, and can I just say that 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 came from seeing a painting of St Agatha with her breasts on a tray that's in the Villa Borghese in Rome. And it struck me that you could see the treatment you go through as, as in a way, as a sacrifice to your future. Um, I've written lots of- is, It's astonishing, yeah. isn't it, in, in art, how, how sanguine the saints are about the loss of body parts. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Here I am with my breasts on a dish, and here I am with my eyes in a bowl, and, and all this business. It, it's quite extraordinary. Um, thank you very much, Anne. Um, now we've got another recording for our next one, and this also takes us to Australia. Michael James Leach, who is uh, like David a couple of minutes ago in Victoria. I recall when the kind ICU staff kept calm, me telling us that my dear mother had become critically unstable, that her young heart now pumped faintly, that her once elevated BP kept on falling and falling and falling, away, that her kidneys and her liver had been starved of blood and gone into shock, that meds and machines had taken over from all of her vital organs, that she was comfortable with all those tubes in the hospital bed, that each one of us should ready ourselves to hear the worst possible news. When the kind ICU staff kept calm, 
these saying, these mournful things, I utterly lost the power of speech, the ability to cry my lungs out as each word cut a fresh wound. The ability to ask docs and nurses the myriad questions ricocheting round and round and round and round. My exhausted and scattered mind. The ability to comfort my family with talk of mom's strong spirit. The ability to rush to her bedside and tell her you're the best mother. There was just one thing I could do. Shake. That was an extraordinary reading. And now we return to these islands and to Tyneside, I think. I'm right in saying Tom. If That's you're right, there, yeah. Tom Lee. Hi, I'm in, yeah, in Newcastle. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, this is called Bed Four. And who's at home with you? I live alone. The wife died 15 years ago. I'm sorry, you never get used to it, do you? Every afternoon she'd go upstairs to do the best beds, get the washing and that. I'd always go to the bottom of the stairs and shout up to check on her, see if she needed help. One day I went to call up and there she was at the bottom of the stairs, still, and I'm still lonely. Thank you. Alison Porter is next. Learning the etymology of diagnosis. The bald mother and her two children grow tired from an afternoon of swimming the shallows. They float on their backs in the gentle, relentless grasp and release of a tropical sea. They decide to take a shortcut back across the deep section. A part of the bald mother will always remain bald, even if her hair grows back. If, when, when, if. Before the mother knows what's happening, the children, good swimmers, have removed their masks and snorkels at possibly a grave distance from land. The best thing she's ever done is lure a hummingbird out of the house with a rose of Sharon taped to a broomstick. It is not enough. They splash about the surface, bubbling with merriment, while the mother treads water slowly, legs churning, hands tracing fine designs atop chill swells, part of her still hoping to encounter some rare fish she treads carefully. Of late, she has recognized that she is treading the waters of her children's memory. She thinks again about hope versus fear, their wordless salts, how you could drown in either, green shading right into blue, how you could lose your bearings forever, how the word procrastination comes from belonging to tomorrow. Here the reef drops so far down, there seems only a vast recollection of reef, of ground, the echo foreshadowing of a huge indigo oblivion. Narrow curtains of muted light shift through a vaguely familiar emptiness. Is it possible she has never been fully loved? These depths are profoundly fishless. When maybe 50 yards to the right, she makes out a dark shape the size of a very large sofa 
suspended several feet below them. She will make sure her voice remains quite steady. Still, the children are cross with her, the way she brightly frightens them back in their flowing and ebbing innocence. Sure and sandwiches, quickly now, and so quickly over years of silt and sediment, wreck and stone pack, cold blurrings of freshwater vents, wobbly glint and ruin. They are swimming together irrevocably through the secret skies of nameless creatures, and they cannot possibly hold everything. If, when, when, if, they reach the far shore. She finds herself breathless, perfectly alive, well beyond riches. Both are true. The gleaming treasure spilling right through her fingers. The sun insisting she keep the warm gold coins. It presses back into her palm. Excellent, Alison. I think you're there somewhere. I can't see you at the moment, but that was a lovely reading and makes an interesting counterpoint to Andy's reading because the arrangement on the page um, does so much work in the visual presentation. And that was the marvelous reading. On my list here, it says Rosie Shepherd next. Thank you. This is a villanelle that uh, explores the relations between uh, the Hippocratic Oath and a kind of manifesto for reading and writing poems. Be not ashamed to say, I know not. We treat the break that broke the man and not whatever breaks his art. Conflating source with form will horse around the cart. Love, be not ashamed to say, I know not and or I am all and not all I speak, but take an oath and make a pledge to find a new color from a form that seeks in some disorder, say a dry sky rain or grass without its green. Delight to light a path for how you treat the break that broke the man and not what breaks in us as what we make in art. You see, we take a form from what we sense we make, from what we miss, not from, from what we take. A face that turns to face us, turns echo into shadow of a past. And so love, love, be not shamed, for we know not, and we are, and are not all we speak. I make a table where we learn, I with you, you with me, from fragrant spiced red teak. Its texture, touch, and scent are one, a paradigm of what's not lost but lasts. For we treat just what we feel for the break that broke the man and not what breaks his form and ours in art. Love, in every making thing, we do not cut for cutting's sake. We hold our subjects from injustice. We keep them close from what might harm. And we are not ashamed to say, I know not, and I am all and not all I speak. For it is Keats who pleads. Say, love, say, what can I do to kill this touch and make myself be free? Touch is a memory, love, the outline of what is shaped. It marks and guides us as we treat what breaks the broken man and whatever breaks in us his art. Be not ashamed to say, love, I know not, I am, and I am not all I speak. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you so much. Karen, Karen Schofield. So this, this poem is about um, how following intensive treatment with chemotherapy, as well as the obvious physical changes that are going to occur to a person's body, it's also about how their sense of self is also changed. I thought it was quite a depressing poem, but towards the end, I didn't really mean it to be towards the end. And the idea is that despite these radical transformations which 
will happen in a lot of cases, there is actually always the hope of a change for the good. In other words, a cure. So the poem is called After Induction Therapy. I wasn't myself and agreed to be corrected, submit to regimes, consent to therapies. I learned the language of pathology and was dysplastic, mutated, translocated. I watched my cells disintegrate, layers of skin shed to leave raw surfaces, nails lift from their beds, and I too am untethered, stripped so bare I hardly recognize myself in the mirror. Even my heart is an echo, faded to a white image on a scan, an electrical trace on thin paper. My body wiped clean, I'm a pattern in transition, purged of mistakes, waiting to be rewritten. Excellent stuff. Thank you very much, Karen. There is a place we've been told for the depressing note now and then. <laughs> I love to think of Kafka reading Metamorphosis to Max Brod and other friends for the very first time. And he and his friends were all in gales of laughter. They thought the text the funniest thing. So we always have to be wary of assuming that texts are depressing anyway, don't we? In which case we'll go on to Randy, Randy Spencer. Oh, thank you for including me. I, this is a, an honor. And uh, I want to say a little bit about the poem before I read it, um, because it's sort of an unusual poem. Um, and it happened a long time ago when I was in medical school, the, the incident of the, or the event that's being described, and I've gone on to practice more than 40 years after that in, in uh, psychiatry, but this was on the pediatric rotation when I was in medical school. At that time, um, they made a, a bold attempt to um, try to save several children who were in liver failure and were comatose by transfusing or perfusing the child's blood through the um, liver of a living chimpanzee that was uh, adjacent to them. And um, uh, it, was a, it was a remarkable effort that um, in the end was not a, a success, but um, they tried to remove the toxins and hope that the liver would heal in the child, but, but that couldn't happen. Um, so it's, the poem is divided into three parts. The first part is the child speaking or seeming to speak it's, um, after waking up from a coma. And the child did wake up for several weeks from the, from the coma. And the second part is the child having these dreams brought about by this chimpanzee strapped to a uh, bed next to him, to the her. And then the third part of the poem is as though the chimpanzee had himself, itself, something to say. So part one, I am awake now after 15 days in a coma. I know where I am. I recognize my parents. We talked until I became tired. I asked questions. I knew what I knew before, only more, that my liver is diseased, why my skin is yellow, why my abdomen is swollen and painful to touch, why I lapsed into a coma. And there were so many transfusions draining my blood. There are still things I don't understand. The chimpanzee, restrained very close to me on a padded board, as though I were keeping it alive, as though my, um, my blood seemingly leaving to enter the animal, as though I was keeping it alive, but then returning. Part two. This is the 10th day since I awoke, and each night I dream the same dream, that I have become the chimpanzee. The dream that I am confined in a cast that covers most of my body, that I'm unable to explain why I can't move even in the slightest.
why I'm locked into this frame, confused, frightened, why I'm connected to this child by clear plastic tubes, entering and leaving my body, why I bleed endlessly through one tube and darker blood returns through another, why my blood flows into that child lying next to me. We have become one body, her blood flowing, merging, flowing, eddying in the rivers of my veins, her red cells filtered through some part of me, her lying so still, so near me, a child who seems unaware of why I'm here. In her dream, her blood enters my body, travels through it, then returns to her. Part three. After five hours, she starts to move, starts to awaken and speak. In my own dream, I have healed the child. They will be able to remove the tubes first from her, then from me. My dream that when it's over, I am released, that I'm allowed to return to the place all chimpanzees dream of returning to. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Randy. What a very curious poem. It was the subject, I mean, not your writing of it, but mm, there's nothing stranger than science. I think we'll go to Susan, Susan Thomas. Hello. Um, this poem is about the very first days of the pandemic. Um, the disbelief that it had actually reached the hospice and come onto the ward and the feeling that we were actually going into a sort of battle um, and the lack of PPE we had at the time and how unprepared we were. Um, and I hadn't heard of the term donning and doffing um, prior to this and um, found it very curious and sort of old fashioned and medieval and it sort of took me back in time. Donning and doffing. There is teaching in the hub. I'm doing donning and doffing of PPE, she said hurriedly. Her eyelashes bash her cheeks like a pantomime horse. She may as well be speaking Elizabethan. Donning and doffing. I'm 53 and know not of what she speaks. I imagine a boy in the hub removing a large velvet cap stuck with a peacock feather sweeping it down in front of his body. My nurses, he bows humbly, catching the inside of his cape, slippered foot pointing forward. I enter the hub, no velvet cap, no cape, no slippered foot. Instead, a plastic apron, paper mask, rubber gloves, B&Q goggles, our personal protective equipment. I would rather a sword, armor and heavy shield. She demonstrates at top speed as surely it won't come to this. A hasty PowerPoint followed by tea on the ward. But this was the point when looking back Along that dusty track, we should have stopped under the shade of an oak tree, taken our time, gathered our armies, checked the chinks in our chain mail, greeted our future with a deep bow and doffed our caps in respect of what was to come. Thank you very much, Susan. Emma is with us, Emma Westerman, um, the last of our health professional commended poets. Well, thank you very much. I think that Susan's poem is probably a better place to stop given all we have been through in the past year, but, but I'd be happy to. I'm in Florida right now where COVID is surging, um, but this poem was from when I was in medical school. It's called Bones Eye Shop. This is all the world you need as a boy, 10 years old, in a hospital room with his mother and father. The boy, 
hooked up to wires, says he knows what he wants to do when he grows up. He wants to open a bonsai shop. That has the ring of forever. A bonsai shop and make his parents work with him. He likes the way the little trees grow in their pots, stretch, fill all the space given, twist their trunks, contort their limbs just to live. Your bones do have eyes, so do your palms and the balls of your feet. Robert Lowell was notorious for changing his mind about his poems in mid-reading, wasn't he? He used to read people completely different texts of his public readings, so that poems that they loved and could virtually recite as he read them came out sounding completely unfamiliar. <laughs> <laughs> that has been, once again, a very, a very mixed and extraordinary reading, a very great deal of thoughtful and moving and sensitive writing happening there, perceptive and affecting all of it. It's, it's always a confirmation, one of these <clears throat> poems to live for sessions, of just how, just how watchful and thoughtful and, and fully responsive the human spirit is. And who would ever be surprised that that should be the case with medical professionals? Of course, we're not surprised. Thank you, all of you. That was that was excellent. Now, as as I mentioned at the beginning, um, the next of these poems to live for meetings is on Wednesday, the sixth of October, and it's to launch a book by Leslie Saunders. Um, she may not be known to those of you who are in the United States or in Australia. Um, for those of you in Britain, she may well be a name who is on your radar because by now she's published a number of books of poetry. She is a tremendously um, thoughtful and literate and well-read person in not just all the ways that you expect poets to be well-read, but in completely unexpected ways as well so that reading her poetry can be quite extraordinarily eye-opening and surprising. And in March of 2020, she began writing poems in response to the COVID pandemic. Um, she contracted it herself at the end of the year. The book that we're publishing called Days of Wonder preserves her poems that she wants to publish from one year of the pandemic, so until March of this year, 2021. Some of the poems were also written as a sort of interplay with paintings by the artist Rebecca Swainston. So the book contains 18 of those paintings in reproduction. And I think that it will strike all of you when you see it as as one of the most extraordinarily thoughtful and thought-provoking um, responses to the last 18 months of pandemic and lockdown experience that we've seen. So I very sincerely, and not just because I've literally today finished my work as an editor, because the file has gone to the printers to print the copies literally today. Um, but not just because I'm editorially involved with this, but because as a reader of, of poetry on medical subjects, I think this is a tremendous book. And we're very happy to be publishing it in a couple of weeks. And on Wednesday, the 6th of October, Leslie Saunders will be in this space, um, giving a reading from, from the book. Um, you will have come across her, of course, in this area before because one of her poems shared third prize fever winter particulars earlier this year. And she's, she's come to the attention, should we say, of the Hippocrates Prize in the past as well. So for those of you 
who want to join us on the 6th of October, please note the date, date in your diaries for the next reading by Leslie Saunders. And then in November, we will finally be publishing a book that's been some time in the making, a book called Storm Brain, which is an anthology, a kind of companion piece to the Hippocrates Book of the Heart, which we did three years ago. This one is about the brain and its many and various afflictions, and it gathers poems and medical texts in the way that the Heart Book did. And we will have two gatherings of readers on the 3rd and on the 17th of November. So those will be our next two sessions after Leslie Saunders. Um, Storm Brain, the title, <clears throat> comes from a poem by Claire Trebien. Those of you who have traveled in tropical places will recognize the play on words. Storm Brain is a phenomenon that you experience when a lot of heavy water needs to be taken off the street side quickly. And Storm Brain is, well, I don't want to take it away because you'll see for yourselves what the poem is like and many others like it. It is um, a wonderfully livid and vivid phrase to brighten and, and stimulate our understanding of what is happening to a brain in trouble and to all of the body that goes with that brain. Um, I think these will be very interesting readings indeed. So that's our program from now till the end of the autumn. Well, I'll just give a, a funny anecdote that happened just this afternoon. Um, my husband, who's an oncologist, um, happened to be off today and he knew how important this meeting was to me. Um, there was another meeting just before it that I was supposed to attend in 90 degree weather outdoors um, for our children's school. And he said, I know you have the poetry reading. How about I go and attend the, the basically mother's meeting at the school <laughs> um, for you? And um, then a few minutes later, he calls and, and asks if I'm willing to, to assist with making what they call boo grams for, for Halloween to raise money for, <laughs> for the school. Um, but I just thought that was really touching and sweet of him. And it's, it's really an, an honor and a pleasure to, to get to know this community. Well, thank you. And thank you very much indeed to all of you for reading. This was, I, I can see old friends who weren't reading tonight. I can see newer friends. And what is very encouraging is the way that that this little community online uh, is thriving and goes on thriving. And the poems that you've written, of course, speak for themselves. The, the judges pick them out. They are very well achieved and extremely well-crafted poems. Um, but apart from that, I think this commitment as well to, to being together in this way is, is in itself a good that we can all um, value. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for reading. And um, thank you, Donald, by the way, because Donald is very much the one who manages these evenings. Without his te technological know-how, it wouldn't happen. So uh, my own personal thanks particularly to Donald. Um, but he's also the one who remembers our sponsors when I forget them. Um, so, uh, so all things considered, I hope very much to see as many as possible of you on the 6th of October.